We walked for about one kilometer from the Rajasthan and came to this beautiful place. This is the mausoleum of Amir Timur, and we'll learn a little bit more about him as we go inside. just stood in front of this board for two minutes and gathered a lot of information for us. So the map over here represents the entire empire that Amit Temur um, had rule over. So it spans all the way from like Georgia, Armenia and like the, the Caucasus <laughs> from the Caucasus region all the way to New Delhi, Kanpur in India, Northern India. So it was a very big empire and it northwards I think it stretched far into like Northern China, Mongolia too. And he is uh, attributed as one of the most ruthless uh, emperors in all of the world. But here in Uzbekistan, he is revered as one of their greatest uh, kings uh, to ever exist. And that is because he spread the culture of Uzbekistan across all of these lands, including in our very own Hindustan. The capital of Amir Temur's rule was here in Samarkand. So that is why we see over here uh, the, the monument we are at, which is the mausoleum where Amir Temur is said to have been buried. You can't really see anything because it's all layered under uh, the actual burial monument itself. But uh, this is what the locals believe and they are here. Maybe there are records here to indicate that that is indeed the case, but um, we don't know. So as you can see, Amir Temur apparently led many invasions all the way from 1365 to 1404. Uh, the latter of which happened in this part of the world and I, I believe up there as well. So India was one of the last few that Amir Temur's uh, people came to conquer and this is where they established one of their bigger cities. And as you can see here, Samarkand was the capital. So the architecture of this place is very similar to the Rajasthan that we saw. Everything is very beautiful with majolica patterns and tiles and artwork on the roof. The only difference is the front facade is thin, narrow and very long. Yeah, so unlike the other places where it's much it's more wide. massive. Yeah. But inside it is said to be uh, gilded in many many sections. So let's go in and check it out. So this family tree actually explains how uh, the Indian Mughal Empire is related to uh, Amir Temur. So Amir Temur, I think this was his first successor, Miron Shah, and then comes down here to Abu Bakr, Ilongir, Umar Shaikh, Jah, sorry, Babur. Yeah. So from Babur, Humayun. So Babur was the one who came to India uh, in the first instance, and then came Humayun, then Akbar, who we all remember, Jahangir, Shah Jahan, who built the Taj Mahal, and then this is Aurangzeb, and then soon after, that's when like the British Empire started to establish its stronghold, so this is where the Mughal Empire sort of ended. is the mausoleum of Ahmed Temur and these other ones are his family and as you can see everything is so rich and golden yellow I'm not too sure if it is all gilded but it's definitely shining like it is just look at the roof so I remember last time I came here people were actually sitting here and praying because of how uh, important this place is for them. I found it quite uh, different because in a lot of the world, in many parts of the world, right, uh, this emperor is looked at as the most being because he took so many lives. But here the people actually do worship him as a god.
So I just learned a little bit more about Amir Temur and I thought I'll share it with you. Amir Temur was definitely a very brutal ruler, but interestingly, he was also called a very strange name, Tamer Lane. So Timur the Lame came because once when Amit Amor was actually out there in the fields trying to hunt some sheep, the shepherd actually shot him with two arrows. One of them pierced through his uh, fingers and the other one hit him in his leg and he lost ability to use that leg completely and he always moved with a limb. So that is how it became Tamer Lane. Now the stark contrast of this story is that even though he was disabled like this, he was still one of the most brutal rulers. In fact, you could even say that he was, uh, in a way, he was a descendant of Genghis Khan. He does have shared ancestry, but he was one of the most powerful Muslim rulers back in that day. This is like around the 1300s, 1300s to 1400s, and he was remembered everywhere. In fact, all the way down to India, uh, there was a Delhi Sultanate at that time, which had just about introduced Islam to India, but he his uh, Amir Temur's strength was so much that within a matter of just a few decades that was entirely eliminated. So the reality of Amir Temur's death was not actually because of war. Uh, while he was out on one of these conquests, he happened to fall ill and it was not too far from here. It was right by the banks of the Sir Darya River, which is one of the most uh, prominent rivers in Central Asia. So he was camping there and while on the way to go and battle the Ming dynasty in China, he fell ill and then soon after he died. Uh, that also led to the withdrawal of these forces from invading China because the Ming dynasty was extremely powerful at that time and only a man like Amir Temur could have actually gone and fought and taken that over. So that's what we learned about Amir Temur. And interestingly, this architecture is still like so well maintained even today. Um, I remember I, I was just staying in a hostel right by this wall. So if you're curious to come and sort of hang out here, like stay here nearby, you have many, many affordable hostels right alongside this building. And then after sundown, you get to see this incredible version of the same monument. So maybe we'll show you that in a little while. We are now walking down a traditional Uzbeki street, minus all the hostels, hotels and tourist places. This is what a regular street in a residential neighborhood looks like. So you see houses everywhere, like very narrow path in between and then kids playing, grandparents out here doing chit chat. <laughs> And this is how they construct houses here, so very similar to in India, they use brick and cement, not wood. Just picked up one ice cream and some cookies. <laughs> is it recording? Yeah. Thank you so much. What is your name? Abdullah. Abdullah. Oh, this is so like big. Magnum. And all this for just 6,000 som. Mm. Mm. Chocolate inside and outside. Yeah. Give me, give me. Whoops. <clears throat> so right now we have come to the mausoleum again. Uh, in about 20 minutes or so, it's supposed to light up very beautifully. So we are curious to see that. I've seen it before, but I wanted Shish to also see it. Uh, she's actually coming there. She's on the phone. So uh, sometimes you guys have asked like, um, what is it like to um, you know, stay in touch with friends and family, uh, especially parents, uh, maybe siblings, etc. when we are on the road. 
Well, Shish and I are both single children. So it's just our parents and probably grandparents that we really speak to regularly. Some of our friends do call. But both Shish and I have a very small friend circle. So we, it's not a lot of people. But this is the reality of traveling full time. Uh, you don't really get to have a lot of relationships. Uh, and sometimes even the ones that you did have before sometimes right. cease to exist. So in our own case, we've seen uh, many people who used to be friends have definitely distanced themselves or maybe we have not done the right thing by putting enough effort but that's what happens when you're on the road and you're just not able to stay in touch for long enough. So a little bit of a glimpse into our personal lives as we explore Samarkand. Shish is just showing her parents where we are. Look, the moon is up already. What is your name? Jasmina. Jasmina. My name is Sheila. Sheila. Nice to meet you. Where did you get your ice cream? How much is it? Uh, the price? 1,000? Ah, 3,000. 6. 3,000. 3, 3, I was looking for it everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet you. You too, you too. Yes. Rahmat, thank you. Now I know where to get my ice cream. <laughs> So in every house and even in every restaurant which is outside on the road you see this big court kind of a thing which is open on one side and closed on three sides and here they have kept one table on top of it and made it like a dining table. So you basically sit on this little mat. Uh, yeah, Indian I style. We can sit yeah. like cross legged, like as if you're sitting on the floor and have a nice dinner. The moon is shining right there, and I'm loving this vibe. And also, we got vegetarian pilaf. We just ordered. We were searching for vegetarian food for so long. We finally got it. So we have just got the traditional Uzbeki pilaf, or they call it as pilaf. So it, it's similar to fried rice, but it has a carrot, capsicum, and I can see some onions on top. I think it's similar to our Indian pilaf. It's very hot. The flavor is quite strong. The taste of the fried carrot and onion is really nice. They have used some sort of oil which is giving a special flavor to it. I really enjoy eating it. It's really tasty. Along with this, they have given us salad. It is just cut pieces of tomatoes and cucumbers. And they have given the traditional Uzbeki bread. And we also got some baked potato. With, I think this is spring onions on top and some chili. Is oh, yeah, it good? It's good. So it's basically very simple, straightforward baked potato. They have used a bit of salt and then there is some chili flavor on it. it it's not like the usual chili we are used to in our parts of Asia, but it's it's pretty nice. And then the spring onion definitely adds a little bit of a onion zing to it, flavor-wise. Thank you. Well, that was a heavy meal and Shish is full. She speaks and burps. So, thanks you guys for coming along with us today. Hope you enjoyed exploring the best of Samarkand. 
There's actually a little bit more in this city that we want to show you. Uh, probably next time though, because we have to go to a few neighboring cities and then come back. Tomorrow we are catching a train to go to a brand new place. So come along with us and we'll see you in the next one. Bye! Bye. Okay, three, two, one.